Tell me, you're gonna say, so uh, lab one, how many, who, how many here had uh, like uh, major sound problems that could not resolve till the end? Uh, well, I mean, like you couldn't do the lab at all, okay? And who did not was in, not able to do the real time part? Oh wow. It just didn't work? No, it was not as good. Well, I, uh, not as good as the. Okay, okay. <laughs> but could you see like uh, some yeah. reflections? Okay, yeah. No, problem. no, nothing? Yeah. So who did not like get it all working? Okay. But the rest was fine? Like you, you were able to see echoes and things like that? Were you able? You said no, right? So I'm just asking like. No, what? The real time you couldn't, right? Yeah, but could you see echoes in the non real time? Okay. All right. Welcome to E133 Lecture 11. Woo! <coughs> I need this for just energy. It's Friday. <laughs> okay, so um, I'm now I'm pumped. <laughs> okay, that's a good start. So, uh, uh, lab one, I mean, the, the real time, there was a couple of things that happened this year that uh, made it a little bit uh, quirky. Is that something happened with new computers? <laughs> so I think they have some, something in the software we couldn't figure out, especially in Windows, that I think they do some low pass filtering. There's some low pass filtering that I just do not understand what is going on. But uh, some computers, and I, I saw a few of them, cannot process sound that's higher than 8 kilohertz. And that's not the microphone, it's actually the software. And it's the operating system. So that changed, and I'm sorry about that, we didn't realize this. The other thing is the, the bokeh, the real-time interface, it was updated, and it's just much slower. So there was a lot of delays with this. Yeah. Yeah, something got screwed up with a new version that they came up, and so the installation has that uh, again. Uh, we'll try to deal with this in the future lab, so I apologize for that. Um, if you have any suggestions or you know frequently asked questions, things like this, please post so we can put it for the you know for next year's. Okay. Um, yeah. So what were we talking about uh, last time? Yeah, we finished the short time Fourier transform. Did we? We didn't. So let me go back. We talked about the time frequency uncertainty principle in which there is inherent ambiguity, uh, there's inherent uncertainty between the ability to resolve, the ability to get time and frequency resolution at the same time. If you have a tone that is, you know, it has a particular frequency, you know it has that frequency. If you observe it over a short time, there is ambiguity of what that frequency is. Same time, if you have, you know a frequency at a very good accuracy, it's very hard to know where it is happening in time if it's isolated. Okay? So that's inherent. And that's given by the Eisenberg uh, uncertainty principle, and it relates also to quantum mechanics and any wave, in fact, uh, phenomenon. Oh. Oh, okay. Did it help you then, DSP class, to solve that quantum mechanic part? <laughs> it's it's actually also true too. Yeah. Okay. I'll I'll, I'll move on because there's, there's a lot to do. But I appreciate that. Okay. So. Um, we talked about the DFT, and in fact, the DFT, if you think of what the, in the, in the case for discrete case, 
the time frequency uncertainty principle is that once you compute DFT coefficients, you lost the ability to resolve time up to n samples. Like you just don't know where the frequency happens within that n samples. But then you have very good accuracy, or 1 over n, uh, uh, sorry, omega uh, 2 pi over n accuracy in the, uh, or your uncertainty is 2 pi over n in the frequency. Okay? And we, sh we said, okay, what if you zero pad? Do you get more information? We said, well, no, you don't get more information. You just get closer to the continuum case where your box can just travel anywhere on the continuum in the frequency domain. That's what really it does, right? Because the more we zero pad, the more we interpolate or get better approximation of the DTFT. But the time uncertainty principle also exists for the DTFT. It's just a box that can now move, not necessarily in steps of you know, uh, 2 pi over n, but it would move a little bit um, you know, in a finer scale. Then we said, OK, what happens when you do the short time Fourier transform? Well, in the short time Fourier transform, you still break the time frequency space into tiles. But now these tiles are not, um, you know, are not stacked on top of each other, but it's more broken into these blocks. Each block has the same exact area as before. But now, because we have better time uh, resolution, we lost the ability to resolve the frequency at the same way. Okay, so we traded off getting better time resolution. So now each short time Fourier transform has information of both time and frequency, but the resolution in time is better at the expense of resolution and frequency. Does this make sense? Okay. So every time you try to get better accuracy in one domain, you lose accuracy in the other domain. This is for a study, sorry. <laughs> okay. That was kind of strange, right? But uh, I'll let you know at the end. Okay. All right. So the effect of tiling that, sorry, the effect of uh, using this R, so overlapping window, was, the, um, was that, again, the same thing, you interpolate time. Okay, if you do overlap, overlapping window, you interpolate time, you don't get more information, both in time and frequency. And in that case, it will be kind of placing those boxes um, on, uh, that are overlapped between um, the one before. So you, again, if you overlap, you approximate the continuum better. But still, the boxes remain the same size. Yes? So in this case, we R is just time. If I also uh, picked up a different N, then that will be also frequency. No, the frequency. <gasps> Overlapping in time. Ah, nice. Good, good job. Good for you. Oh, that's great. Time or. See, I give a lot of opportunity for paying attention. And let's go to the list. All right, I'm at a quite significant loss so far. Last name? T A U Z, two bucks. That's great. Okay. Oh, file was erased. So sorry. <laughs> okay. Time of the effect of R on tiling in time or frequency. Great. Okay, moving on. So here's an application of time frequency analysis. If you look at the spectrogram of a sound coming from an orca whale, right? It's actually quite complex sound. Right? So if you look at it, I mean, it's quite complex. If we just looked at the spectrum, it would not represent what is going on. If you then look at frequency versus time and seconds, you see the changes in uh, pitch and tones and frequencies that are occurring at different, at different times. 
So much more information there. Okay? So it's a big deal to try to understand what's going on both in time and frequency. You can, do, you can use it to analyze signals. You can use it to uh, come up with features to recognize signals, and so on and so forth. So let's do, uh, let's do um, uh, I guess, let's do this. OK, so let's say I have now two spectra. There's a lot of parameters that we can change. Right? We can change R, we can change W, we can change N, and things like that. So how those are going to affect us? So what is the difference between the spectrogram, uh, the following spectrogram? Who, who, wants to, who wants to give it a shot? I think I did it as like a show. I think. Yeah. <laughs> who wants to do it? Come on. I need a volunteer. I'll pick one. Go for it. What's the difference between the two? This is the bird chirping. Well, that's that's the you have an option. Do you want to do fifty fifty? <laughs> like uh, you know, you cut off like two. That's what I mean. You're gonna go with D. Uses overlapping windows. Anybody else? <laughs> okay. Well, the window size is different, and here's here's what um, here's why. If you uh, sorry, the window type is different. What you see here is a lot of spectral leakage, right? So whenever you have the spectrum, you see there's a lot of kind of side lobes that are happening, okay? As opposed to here, sorry, as opposed to here, which you uh, which you don't have that as much. It's hard to see kind of what the thickness is, but the side lobes indicate that probably this one uses a rectangular window, and the other one uses some other type of a window, which decays faster. Okay. Um, so here was the result. In one case, we use the Hamming window. In the other case, we use the rectangular window. Okay. All right. I'll give you. An, uh, we'll give you another. I need another volunteer. Volunteer. Okay. Ready? It's the Orca one. Yeah? You want fifty fifty? What? Okay, just say what you think. Shh. You're going to say A? So the difference is that the window size in B is smaller than the window size in A. In A, you've got better spectral resolution, right? <coughs> so the window that we used is a higher is, is a longer window. Longer window gives you better spectral resolution. But if you look at the change over time, it's kind of like quantized. You see these blocks over time? It's not as good. Uh, you, for example, it's hard to see here. I mean, are these distinct shapes, or maybe this is just going up? Here, you obviously see there was some some sort of a high res, you know, a high time temporal information that that happened there. Okay, so there's better temporal resolution. Now, at the expense of spectral resolution. Here you cannot resolve the difference between uh, the individual harmonics. Here you can, but here you have better temporal resolution. Okay? So again, trade-offs. So in that case, <coughs> one case used the Hamming window of 32, the other one used Hamming window of 64. Okay. Questions? Yeah. What?
I don't remember what was COD. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. See, window type is different. Uh, it could have been that window type is different, but that's not the major thing that's going on here, right? Because it's obviously, uh, you see that this peaks are much, wi much wider, right? Uh, much wider, and then um, it's obviously that this is more quantized in time, where this is not. Yeah. But it could have been that also, maybe, the windows. What do you mean zero every other one? Okay, or something else. <laughs> Let's move on. So that this is it's not a window anymore. This is kind of modulation multiplied with zeros and ones. We'll talk about this. Oh, so if you if you zero pad your window, is that right? Okay, we'll talk about it later. It, it, the, the, when we talk about up sampling, that's something else. But the idea here was, yeah, we use the larger window. You got a better. Comp uh, comp Frequency resolution, as opposed to trading off that and getting more um, temporal resolution by using a shorter window. So here are just the other examples of spectrograms. Uh, this is a spectrogram of uh, FM radio. Okay, if you look at FM radio, this is a spectrum that, you, that you're going to get. This is 88.5. Um, can we hear it? No? Uh, this is, uh, I don't know, NPR or something, so they have a lot of voice here. What is FM radio? It's frequency modulation. So you modulate the frequency based on the speech. Okay. And so if you think about what's actually going on, the signal is um, some, uh, the signal that you have is modulated in the frequency. So you have a cosine that its frequency changes. <coughs> and what you get is really is the integral over your signal. And the reason that's the integral of your si of, over your signal because integral of your signal, uh, if you take the derivative of the phase, derivative of the phase is the frequency. And so if I take the derivative, this is the phase component. If I take the derivative of the phase, I will get a, um, a frequency at Fc, and I, I will get also my signal. Okay? Does this make sense? Derivative of a phase is frequency. If I look at what the phase here, this is the signal that I want to modulate. I take the derivative of the phase. This is just a constant component. So I'm going to get a frequency offset at Fc, which is 88.5. And then if I take the derivative of that, I'm going to get delta F times my Xt. So the frequency deviation is going to depend on delta F. And it's going to also depend on my signal. Okay. So this is the spectrogram. Now once you demodulate this, this is actually what's interesting in FM radio. In FM radio, XT is quite complex. It's not just um, it, it is not just the voice. And if you look at what XT is, when you're looking at broadcast FM radio, I mean broadcast FM radio has stereo in it, right? It actually ha have some information that they also send. How they do that? And so if you look at what XT, what is the baseband signal? The baseband signal is composed of the left plus right channels. So that's the mono part. Okay. That's regular. Like you just add them together, no modulation whatsoever. Just add them together. Then you also transmit a pilot at 19 kilohertz. Okay. Then at 38 kilohertz, at twice the frequency of the pilot, you transmit L minus R that's amplitude modulated. That's how the stereo shows up. Okay? So at 38 kilohertz away, you've got amplitude modulated left minus right channel. And then at 57 kilohertz, which is three, the third harmonic, you uh, transmit um, the RBDS, which is digital data that gives you information about the station. Some radios will, you know, when you, when you tune into a station, will show you kind of information. And that's actually digital information. It's called RBDS, and that's its 57 kilohertz. This is the baseband signal. All that stuff here, X of T, goes up here and then is frequency modulated. Okay? 
So it's kind of like there's a modulation here that it, in, that's AM that's then added onto an FM carrier. So if you think of it, these like Russian balls, uh, dolls that you, you know, you have one doll, then you open it, oh, there's another one, like you open, oh, there's another one, you open, like you have to demodulate a few things in order to, to get back to the original signal. Yeah? So what is a pilot? So a is just a pure tone. And it's a phase reference for this one. Okay? Uh, if, and it's a phase reference for, for this one. So if you look at what X, the spectrogram of X of T for, uh, that's after I demodulated 96.5, it was uh, sung by Adele, and it looks like this. So this is a one-sided spectrum. Now it's real. It's not two-sided. It's, two it's real. Um, and it's off zero. So that's the left plus right. That's the pure tone at 19 kilohertz, and that's a reference tone. You can use that tone in order to demodulate the left minus right. And then here there was RBDS. It's kind of hard to see, but it's kind of weak. But there is these two lines over here. Okay. Now here's a cool thing that uh, you'll do at lab three, which is, as it turns out, people don't stop there. Some station will also transmit what's called subcarriers on 67 kilohertz and 92 kilohertz. And subcarriers are other stations that I know uh, that want to kind of loop in onto your main carrier. So um, our station up on the hill, 94.1 kPFA. Uh, if you look at the spectrum that it has, this is left minus. This is left plus right. This is 19 kilohertz. This is left minus right. That's the RBDS. And now we've got here two subcarriers. That are one is a French Haitian station, and then that one is a Punjabi radio. Okay, at 92 kilohertz. And these are FM modulated. That is, again, FM modulated. Okay? And what you're going to do in lab three is be able to decode those stations, listen to them, and that's what you kind of heard right now. This is actually that station over here. But really, it was, I don't know, doing something else. You know, like if you have a normal radio, you hear something else. You'll hear the left plus right and the stereo. These stations you will not hear unless you have a special radio that knows how to demodulate them. They'll be hidden. Effectively, they'll be low-pass filtered and then removed. Yeah? Right, so, so, right. So, he, so if you have a radio that doesn't support stereo, you demodulate and then you low-pass filter below 19 kilohertz and then you've got yourself the mono. Backward compatible. If you have a radio that once you do stereo, then yeah, it demodulates that and then adds them together. Right? Yeah. I, I, I can't change it. Change it. It's in the video. It's be left forever. Yeah, I, I did that too. Okay. Last name again. Ah, oh, four bucks now. Good for you. Yeah, go for it. Uh, it's specialized right, uh, station. So you know, if you if you are French Haitian and you want to listen to French Haitian radio, then you would do that. Whatever, uh, spelled wrong. Spelled wrong. Oh, where? Uh, one, only one in a slide. Thank you. That's great. That's great. That's, this is great. OK. It's good that I have this rule for one slide. OK. So here's another one. So uh, if you look at digital communication, this is uh, what's called JT65. is frequency uh, shift keying in the HF bands. OK, so this is a ham radio protocol. And you see that over, so now this is time, this is time, and this is frequency. And now you kind of see. Uh, different frequencies are active at different times, and you can encode information using those frequencies. Okay. Um, there's a really nice website, which is Signal Wiki, that I want to show you. Uh, if you go there, it kind of identifies, especially now that you're going to have like uh, 
a software, you, you're, you have the software-defined radio, you can kind of look at the spectrum and see all sorts of spectrograms. And you, um, if you look at the shapes, you know, different type of modulations will look very different. And so that's a, way, a place to go and to try to figure out what, what you're looking at. Okay? So just by their shape. Um, here's just a, uh, let me just pick one. Oh, this one I like. This is a ham radio. This is a ham radio text-to-text uh, -text protocol. Frequency shift keying. It sounds like that. Changes frequency over time. With lots of nice error correction. Um, this is digital. Uh, what else we have here? Differential global positioning system. Let's put, pick up a great one. FM, FM broadcast radio. It looks like that. Um, and so on and so forth. High frequency data and voice links in Spain. All right, so lots of them. And then you can just look at all of these and uh, try to figure out where you're looking at. I think this is a really nice effort by a community. Any questions up to here? Pirate? Yeah. What do you mean? Yeah, okay, so with FM, with FM, and this is not a radio class, but you can go to my radio class. With FM, only the strongest station survives. Okay, so if you just transmit stronger, you're good. What if you, what if you transmit like I want to move on. I have a radio class. That's, that's exactly why we do this. But you can come afterwards and we can ask questions. Okay, so let's say now you've got yourself a short time Fourier transform. And you would like to reconstruct back the signal from the short time. Now remember, this is a mapping from a uh, one-dimensional space into a two-dimensional space. However, um, uh, however, in the discrete case, if you have non-overlapping window, you still keep the same dimensionality. Right? Dimensionality is not increasing. It's a two-dimensional space, but the same number of values. If you have overlapping windows, well, then uh, you have more, after you do the transformation, there's more values. But if you don't have overlapping window, that's not a problem. So if you have the short time Fourier transform and you use non-overlapping windows where R equals L, and now you've got yourself the, the window here, in order to reconstruct, all you need to do is you're going to take whatever um, inverse DFT of that particular window that you picked, inverse DFT, and then you need to renormalize back to the by the window. Right? Does this make sense? Uh, how did you calculate? I took a chunk, multiplied by a window, computed DFT. I want to go back. I take that DFT chunk, take an inverse DFT, and then divide by that window. And then I'm going to get back my signal. One to one, no problem, right? Right. No problem? Obviously, there is one because I said, what's the problem? What's the problem? Uh, the window could have zeros, but usually, maybe it doesn't. Maybe it doesn't, but it has small values. When you d whenever somebody tells you, oh, yeah, just deconvolve something. If somebody says, oh, yeah, no problem, just perform a deconvolution. Deconvolution usually is dividing by something in the frequency domain. In this case, you divide by, by a window. Anytime you divide by something, that is um, a recipe for noise amplification and error amplification. Because okay? if you divide by a small number, you're going to amplify something significantly. Now, that's not a problem if you compute a spectrogram back and forth. Maybe numerical accuracy would affect your ability to you know, get something accurate, but it's not usually an issue. But what if you did some processing on the spectrogram, 
and then you do the, try to do the inverse. That effect of dividing by a window is a huge problem because you can amplify those um, uh, artifacts that you introduce. Okay? So that's an issue. What you could do then is to have a more stable reconstruction by having overlapping windows. And if you have um, overlapping windows of 50% at least, uh, if you actually use a hand window or a Bartlett window, you really no, don't need to do any division whatsoever because those windows overlap in a, in a way that they actually sum to one. Okay? So, in fact, if you look at the operation that you're doing, it is, in fact, a pseudo-inverse okay? because you have more values than you've started with, and then you have to project back, and you do that by performing what's called a pseudo-inverse. But um, this is a much more stable type of uh, way of doing processing in the frequency domain, uh, in, in the spectrogram. But the question is, like, why would I even want to do that? And here's an example. Let's say you want to remove noise from a bird chirp. Okay. You want to remove noise from, a, from this chirp. So what I could do is I say, well, you know, if there's a lot of noise in these frequencies, I can like do a bandpass filter, right? That makes sense, right? But there's a lot of noise happening here too. But the signal is quite complex. Maybe I can exploit some structure in that signal in order to remove more noise. And then if you look at what a spectrogram looks for this particular signal, it looks very sparse. Basically, at every time point, there's just very few frequencies that are active, right? So if this was noisy, what you would basically have is you have that signal and you have noise overlaid on it. How do I remove noise? Just, just wipe it up, right? Smooge it. Like, I know where the, my signal is. I can create basically, you know, Clean that part up, clean that part up, not touch the, the middle, clean that, not touch here, clean there, clean there, clean there, not touch, right? Or a simple operation like a threshold, threshold. If I do a threshold, then I do, and that, that would get rid of a lot of the noise, right? Wouldn't, won't touch my signal. And that's what's, Kind of very interesting. When I, you do a threshold, first of all, it's a nonlinear operation. But in fact, what you're doing is an adaptive filter. If you think about this, it will adapt for different time points. It will adapt to different frequencies, right? And it would be kind of a bandpass filter that adapts to your filter, uh, to adapts to your signal. Yes. Uh, that could have been, this could have been harmonics, could have been uh, jumps, you know, so it's like a, like a delta impulses. Well, it depends how, what's your threshold, <laughs> right? It depends what your threshold is. And obviously when you r remove noise, you might also touch some of your signal, but it's always about the trade-off between how much, okay? So the cool thing about sparse signals, and I'm going to emphasize this more and more, is that once you have a sparse representation of signals, it's really easy to separate between signal and noise. So in this case, it was quite hard to separate between signal and noise. Well, I could separate at least here because it's band limited. Okay? Yes, I can do that. But I cannot do anything here just with regular filtering. I would probably touch some of my signal if I do that. When I go to this representation, right, I can do much more. Right? So that's what makes it much more, uh, um, much more powerful. Okay? So t applying transformation that makes signals sparse makes it easy to model them, compress them, as well as de denoising them. Okay. okay. So what's the limitation of the short-time Fourier transform? First of all, you need to have overlapping if you want to do a stable reconstruction. So it's really not an orthogonal transformation. Going back and forth, um, if you do an operation in one domain, you need to, I mean, it might not have a representation in the signal domain. You have to kind of project it back. 
average it. I can create signals in the, in the short time Fourier transform that cannot exist if I have a signal and move it you know, forward. Because I have more, you, you map n to m times n. So if I change something in this m times n dimensional space and I go back, it might not have a representation in the n dimensional space. Does this make sense? I take a, I take a rope. I put it on a table. Instead of putting it in a line, I put it on a table, embed that one-dimensional signal in a two-dimensional space. Okay, that's great. But now I take like stickers and you know I put some other stuff. I mean I cannot go back into this one-dimensional space again by unrolling that. Right? Some, something's going to change. Okay, there, I cannot take a rope and create like something with stickers. Okay, but in the other domain I can. Yeah. Right, it is the same dimension if I have, but it's not a stable reconstruction. So, right? Yeah, absolutely. It is com more computationally intensive to do this. Um, the computation is mn times log n, so depending, you know, how many overlaps you're going to do, right? So you do more DFTs than necessary. But the thing is, you also get the same Eisenberg, Eisenberg boxes sizes all the time, right? It's just the same size. And so what we want to do maybe is try to think something differently. And here's the idea. The basic idea that people have realized is that if you have something that changes slowly, you don't need to track it in time very well because it's going to change slowly in natural signals. Okay? If you have some low frequency stuff that's going on. I don't necessarily need to track it very fast over time. But I want to be able to have better um, spectral resolution there. But things that are actually changed fast, maybe I want to track them fa uh, fast in time. And maybe I want to trade off the ability to resolve you know, between 1, giga 1 gigahertz and 1.1 gigahertz, or uh, 1.0001 gigahertz. Maybe I don't need that resolution at those frequencies. Maybe I'm okay to have a resolution in the, in the gigahertz ranges of you know, 1 and 1.1, 1.2. But when I go down to the scale of you know, 10 hertz, yeah, I want to distinguish between 10 hertz and 11 hertz or 12 hertz. Okay. So how do I do that? In some way, I need to adapt those Eisenberg boxes to the frequency. So different frequencies should have different box size. Again, you cannot completely, I mean, like, there's always going to be the trade-off, right? If I have better resolution in one dimension, it's going to hit me in the other one. So, short time Fourier transform. So that's uh, basic, the basic idea. So what we're going to do now is going to go a little bit back to continuous time and talk a little bit about continuous time again. And then we're going to go uh, return to discrete time. And here's the two different things that I'm going to present to you. These are two transformations. The upper one is the one that you, we, you're familiar with, that we just covered, which is the short time Fourier transform in continuous time. Short time Fourier transform in continuous time, you've got yourself Eisenberg boxes, same size, dependent that are dependent on the window that you pick in time. And that gives you a certain uh, spatial resolution, in fact, uh, uh, sorry, uh, temporal resolution. And in fact, that also gives you the ability to resolve frequencies. But the entire space is the same. And if you look at what the short time Fourier transform maps you to, what it maps you to, so there's, you, you move your window around. Okay, your window is moving around. And then you compute a Fourier transform on that window. Okay? So if you start from a signal that is in time, we're going to map the signal that, that has a variable time into a two-dimensional signal 
which has a variable u, which is the shift, and it has a variable capital omega, which is the frequency. Okay. So that signal f is now mapped into s um, f, which are parameterized by u and omega. So the coefficients of the short time Fourier transform, the continuous one, have a representation both in u, which is where are we shifted in time, and omega, which where we shifted in frequency. Each coefficient, each value. Does this make sense? Okay. We're going to do something else now. The, the things that we're going to make uh, do is do a slightly different transformation. The transformation now, and all of this, by the way, is multiplied by a Fourier kernel, like a complex exponential. Right? So the frequencies are given by this complex exponential, multiplied by this window. You can think of this as the new kernel of the short time Fourier transform. Each coefficient represented by a window that's shifted and a particular frequency. Does this make sense? In the wavelet case, we're going to use something else. Instead of using a window and a frequency, we're going to use some other function. And that function is going to be finite in time, maybe, or localized in time. It's going to be shifted. We can shift it around that function. And we can scale it, stretch it. Stretch it or compress it. You don't know what this function is right now. But just think of it as here, I multiply by this function. And in fact, I took an, what's called an inner product. Okay, This is inner product in the continuous time. In, you integrate over all of that. Here, again, you do the same thing. With this function that I can translate and, sh and stretch. Those would correspond to, remember, when you stretch something, if I have something like an accordion, right? If you look at the variation over space, it has a particular frequency content, accordion. And when I stretch it, what happens to its frequency content? Yeah, uh, yes, right? So I stretch it in time, its frequency content shrinks. Right? So, but I stretch it, so now it has more time coverage. Does this make sense? So more time coverage, but the frequency shrinks. What happens with a short time Fourier transform? I only change frequency, so it's same size window, but I only change frequency by changing the, the e to the j omega. Right? That's how I change the frequency. But it keeps the same size window. For this case, I'm going to change the frequency by stretching, but I'm also going to get more time coverage. And the way that that breaks the time frequency space is into these boxes. At the low frequencies, you're going to have a box that stretch over time, but is really narrow in frequency. On the high frequencies, you have something that's going to be narrow in time, but it's stretch over many frequencies. Okay, This is what we're going to do. So how does that work? The wavelet transform is defined the following way. The function uh, phi is also called a mother wavelet. That's the name, a mother wavelet. And it must sat satisfy a few things. So there's many kinds of wavelets. I mean, there's one Fourier transform, but there's many kinds of wavelets. It must satisfy two things. One, that has a unit norm. Okay? So if you integrate, um, it's no if, you, if you compute a norm of it, then the norm is one. Okay? The other one is that if you integrate the mother wavelet, its area is zero. If the area is zero, it means that it must be a bandpass. Okay? It has a certain band of frequency that it represents. It doesn't represent DC, right? And it's going to be also finite in time, so it's not going to represent the highest. I mean, there's going to be a limit to what the highest frequency we're going to be representing. So these are only bandpass filters, effectively. You can think of it as just bandpass filters that satisfy a unit norm. You want to see examples? Okay, let's look at an example. 
I call these atoms. And the reason it's atoms is because we're going to build the short time Fourier transform but of a linear combination of these components. So you can think of them as atoms. That's another terminology that people use. The short time Fourier atom is a window that's shifted in time and a frequency. And it's complex values. Okay? So it kind of looks like that. This is a Hamming window and a particular frequency. For omega being high frequency, it looks like that. For omega being low frequency, it looks something like that. Okay? And I'm going to mu multiply this with my signal and then integrate. That will give me this one point in the short time Fourier transform. Then I'm going to shift it around. I'm going to get time in U, uh, uh, more measurements in U. And then if I modulate it at different frequencies, I'm going to get in omega. Okay. Wavelet is something different. I'm going to start with something that looks like that. For s equal 1. So I have s and I have u that I can change. As opposed to omega and u. Okay. So for s equal 1, it's going to look like that. That's the mother wavelet. And then if I want to get different u's, I multiply this by my signal and then integrate. I shift it, multiply by signal, and integrate. And then for different s's, like s equal 3, I'm stretching this. Now I get more time support and less frequency support. So I get narrow frequency coverage with more time coverage. That's how I'm get, gaining that modulation. You know, that's how I can change the frequencies. So it's slightly different than this, right? This is constant window, different frequency. Here, the window varies, and so the frequency varies as well because of the stretch. Does this make sense? It's a big difference. Between them. Yep. So for S being really, really high, I'm going to get really low frequency content, narrow bandwidth, but huge time coverage. Hence, my Eisenberg box is going to be really narrow and wide. Narrow in frequency and wide. For high frequencies, this one, I'm concentrated over a small amount of time, so good time resolution, but then this has a high bandwidth. So I, my uncertainty in the, in the frequency is quite high. And I have the ability then to control these. So why is it not, what, well, if you take the Fourier transform of this, it has frequency content, right? So it's like a filter. When I filter my signal, I'm going to have only a band of frequencies that are going to be left. That's why I'm saying frequency, right? I mean, when I filter with this, I'm getting basically a single frequency over that, I mean, over that window, right? Same way. I'm getting, this is also a bandpass filter. This is also a bandpass filter. It's just different ones. This one I generate by stretching it. This one I generate by modulating. Okay. Does this make sense? Yeah. S is the scale. So S equal 3 means that I'm going to stretch my signal by a factor of 3. Stretching signal by a factor of 3. When you stretch something, you also change its frequency. Yeah, that's the, this is a convolution wavelength. You'll see that it actually can be implemented by a convolution. You can or not. I mean, like, yeah, it, this is symmetric, so it doesn't matter really. But, but it doesn't have to be symmetric. But then it will be just like a flip version. So yes, so maybe it's not the, conv you know, the definition of a convolution, we're actually going to represent it by the definition of a convolution, but it's a convolution with something. Maybe it's the convolution with a flipped version, right? So it's like whatever you think. So it is filtering. I mean, actually, the Fourier transform is filtering with a sinusoid, <laughs> right? That, that's what it's doing. Okay. All right. So here are some examples of these type of filters. One of them is called Mexican hat. And this is this function. 
that function satisfies, you know, unit norm, and it satisfies being bandpass. It looks like this looks nice, huh? Yeah. And it's compact in space, and it has a certain fre frequency content. The other one is called HAR, the HAR wavelet. And HAR wavelets are basically square waves. You know, just one cycle of a square wave. Okay? If you integrate over it, zero, its magnitude is one. It has frequency content. It's not great localization and frequency, but it, it is a bandpass filter. Okay, because square wave is a sink in the frequency domain. Frequency is sink is more concentrated in one frequency than the other. So here's an example of what a chirp, a wavelet transform of a chirp looks like. Okay, this is the chirp in time, and this is the wavelet transform as a function of u and s. For the high frequencies, you actually see the chirp. Right? You see the chirp, and it's mostly concentrated in this area when you're actually applying the high frequency. Right? So you've got good time resolution. But it's kind of hard to see what the frequency is, because like you get like a band here. For the low frequencies, you don't have great time resolution, but you've got good frequency resolution. So it kind of looks like that is U is V. These are cross sections for different U's and different V's. The difference with this and a short time Fourier transform that was really slow would be something like that. That is the wavelet transform of a chirp. And a short time Fourier transform would basically look like that with the same width over and over again. Okay. My point is that you won't be able to see kind of small variation here, but here we can see small variations that are happening in the signal. But we don't know exactly what the frequency content is. You know, we know that it's high frequency, but we don't know exactly what it is. Here's another example of a wavelet transform. This is called, uh, this is a particular signal, and this is using the sombrero wavelet or the Mexican hat. And this is log S, and this is U. And if you look at that signal here, you know, if you've got these bumps and you've got this kind of overall kind of slow moving thing here, and you see that you've got information at kind of different scales. The coarsest scale kind of gives you the smooth version of your signal. If you look at the intensity over time, you know, it intensify and decreases, right? And that corresponds to intensifying and decreasing. The fine scale really shows you just the edges, where the edges occur. Right? You, have, you know exactly where edges occur. See? Edge occurs here. You see an intensity. Edge occurs here. So you get good time resolution. But an edge represents like almost all frequencies, right? So with a Fourier transform, I would never be able to see that. Right? Now I can see the edges really well. So it's a different representation. Okay? All right. So I'm going to finish now. What we're going to do uh, next week is finish covering wavelets. Wednesday will be the last day of material covered for the midterm, which is next Monday, the Monday after that. Okay? And on Friday next week, we're going to talk about lab, uh, yeah, lab two. Okay. That'll be nice. Did you see it moving? I could see it moving, but it was, everything was just so dominated by the ceiling. Really but you can move the, if you move the laptup, you oh, yeah, see. If I move the laptop up and down, I can totally yeah. see that moving. Yeah. Yeah.